Hey Bellevue family, hope everyone is well today. You know, there's definitely a lot going on in our world these days and I'm so thankful for the blessing of being able to slow down and being able to worship our amazing God. Hope that many of you were able to get together uh, today with a small group and worship together and I hope you'll be able to continue to do that throughout the month of June if you feel comfortable doing that. We're really looking forward to being together on June the 17th for our first Wednesday night devotional and hope you'll be able to join us for that. If you were unable to see the plan that our Assembly Safety Committee put out, you can view that on our website. You know, in June, is, uh, it's usually when we begin our summer series on Sunday evenings that we call Inspire. Uh, this year it's going to be different since we aren't meeting on Sunday evenings, uh, but we were able to get four of our speakers to record a lesson that we're going to be using in the month of June for our online worship. And each week before our speaker uh, gives his message, I'm going to be giving an introduction uh, so you'll, you'll know who they are and where they do their ministry. And uh, we'll be sharing also our speakers' addresses and, uh, on our recording, but we'll also have those in our daily updates so that you can send a thank you note to each speaker. And I really want to encourage you to, to bless these men with encouraging words for taking time to share a message from God's Word. You know, one of my favorite phrases is, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And today I encourage you to sing out with all your heart, and to tell God how much you love him and to thank him for all that he's done for you. He's in control and he's on his throne. God is good. So let's worship. This is
I grew up in uh, North Alabama. In fact, my home was three miles north of the Tennessee River in Wheeler Dam. One of the events that happened in my childhood was that the Wheeler Lock, for some reason, just collapsed. Part of that lock just gave way, and then all of that water from the Tennessee River came gushing over. It just stopped the, the water traffic in the river, and it created just great havoc there. It called national attention to our little town of Elgin Crossroads, Alabama, and national news media were there, and a lot of, uh, of course, technicians coming in and workers to uh, try to repair the damage. I thought about that event this past week. I don't know how long it's been since I thought about what happened over 50 years ago. I don't even remember the last time I thought about Wheeler Dam giving way. But for whatever reason, I remember that this past week. Well, communion is a road sign. It helps us to remember on life's road what Jesus did thousands of years ago. Not just 50 years ago, but thousands of years ago. It's a time that we stop, we think about Jesus coming to this earth, living among people, and then his willingness to die in order that we could have eternal life. And communion brings that memory back, especially for us that partake of it on a weekly basis every week, so we don't forget. God's grace, God's love for us. Now, I don't know about you, but I have trouble not only remembering things in the past, a lot of things happened in my childhood I've long forgotten, but I have trouble remembering what I'm supposed to do in the future. And post-it notes really helped me. I don't know who invented them, but I sure am glad they did because I write down on that post-it note, I put it on the kitchen counter, either on the table in the kitchen, what I'm to be doing, a reminder of what's coming up in the future. Well, communion can be a reminder to us, not of the past, but it can serve as a post-it note for the future. Jesus tells us in the 10th chapter of John, that he is the good shepherd, that he loves his flock, he looks after his flock, he cares for his flock, and he reaches, he goes to get other people, to get sheep that are not in the flock to be part of that. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is with us today, this week, and in the weeks to come. We sing a song, and part of just a couple of verses of that it says he walks with us and he talks with us that's now jesus is with us now god the father god the son god the holy spirit they are with us today i'm convinced that we have a lot of blessings seen and unseen that Jesus tending to his flock tends to us in a way that we're not always aware of the blessings that we're receiving, but it's there. So it's very reassuring to me to think that we do not walk in this life alone. Jesus walks with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to walk on this earth, to live among people, and of his willingness to die in order that we could have eternal life. We partake of this bread as we remember the sacrifice of his body on that cross, and we remember the love that you have for us. And it is my prayer that you will give a special blessing today to each person that partakes of this the, fruit, the, the bread and the fruit of the vine that participates in this communion. I pray a special blessing to them. 
And it is in Jesus' name we offer our prayer. Amen. Dear God, we remember the sacrifice Jesus made and the blood that was spilled on the cross a long time ago. That blood represents the cleansing power that we receive in having our sins washed away it's because of the blood that Jesus spilled. We remember that moment and we remember the resurrection of Jesus and the promise that we too will be resurrected and to live with you in heaven. We thank you for this cup, which we take in remembrance of the blood of Jesus. May we do so in a worthy manner, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. We're so glad to have David Hunsker with us this morning. 
bringing us a message from God's Word. A little bit about David. He received his degree from Harding University, both in education and in ministry. He's previously served as the youth and family minister in Kingsport, Tennessee, and as a Bible teacher at the Middle Tennessee Christian School in Murfreesboro. He's currently the campus minister at North Boulevard's West Murfreesboro campus, where he empowers believers to make disciples and plant churches. And, and David says that having experienced God's love since early childhood, he's just really passionate about helping other people discover God for themselves. And he says he enjoys making disciples by hosting dis discovery Bible study groups in his home along with his wife, Kristen. And he's the proud father of four energetic kids who've made life very interesting uh, during these last few weeks. Uh, so like I said earlier, remember to send David a, a, a card thanking him for his willingness to speak to us this morning. Good morning, Bellevue Church of Christ. I'm really glad to be with you this morning. I don't know where you're watching this from. You might be in your home. You might be watching it at the church building if you are starting to trickle back in to a gathering together. I want you to know where I'm coming from. Right now, I'm sitting at the Lane Agri Park in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, where it's typically a farmer's market and where cattle are shown throughout the week and so on. But on Sunday mornings, it's transformed into a place of worship. And the West Murfreesboro campus of North Boulevard Church of Christ meets here where I get to be one of the ministers. Uh, so I'm coming right here from a stage that will soon be taken down and packed away into a trailer. But we as a church and as a campus just want to welcome, uh, no, greet you and hope that you're doing really well through these really strange and difficult times. Speaking of strange and difficult times, the question that I want to address this morning is how do the people of God thrive in the midst of a crisis? What is it that we know what is it that we do uniquely from others in this world that will set us up to not just survive, but thrive in the middle of a crisis? And to begin, I want to start with a story of someone you might know, not personally, but you might have at least heard the story of Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot, I'll start her story when she goes off to Wheaton College, where she studied classical Greek and she wanted to translate the New Testament into languages that it had never been translated into before. This is just the type of girl she was. When she was at Wheaton, she met the love of her life, Jim Elliott. And as they pledged to be married, they also pledged to missions and to taking the gospel to unreached people groups. And this led them to Operation Aka, where there is an Ecuadorian tribe that had never heard the gospel that was unreached, and that was known around the world to be homicidal. Very, very violent tribe. So Elizabeth and her husband Jim, along with a team of others, five other men and four other women, make their way to Operation Aka, where Jim has a best friend, Nate Saint, in a bush plane, a yellow bush plane, that they fly over these Aka Indians and they drop presents, peace offerings, these gifts, to make first contact with the Akas. After a period of time doing that, Jim gets the green light to go ahead and make contact with these Aka Indians. And so in 1956, Elizabeth waits for the good news that Jim and these four other men have made contact and have spread the gospel among the tribesmen of the Akas. Instead, the word comes back that her husband and these four other team members have been speared by these tribesmen in the Aka. What do you do next? If you're Elizabeth Elliot, what do you do next? If you're any of these men's wives and family members, what's the next step that you take? How do you handle crisis and tragedy and setback? Well, the Jewish people are not unfamiliar with tragedy and calamity and crisis and setback. And they, the people of God, have recorded a great history in the Old Testament about how time and time again they encountered crisis. And what do you do when you encounter it that sets you apart from others in this world who also encounter crisis? I want to take you to a psalm to answer that question. How can the people of God not just survive but thrive in the face of crisis situations? The psalm I want to take you to is Psalm 126. And this psalm is relatively unknown among the circles that I've run with my whole life. It's not very popular. I, I haven't heard it quoted. I don't see it in decorations or on necklaces or bracelets. It's definitely not in league with the 23rd Psalm 
or even Psalm 100 or Psalm 105. This one is relatively untapped. Uh, among the circles I run with, maybe you know it well. But the Israelite people know this psalm backwards and forwards. It's at least recited three times annually as they make pilgrimages to Jerusalem. It is a psalm of ascent. So as you approach the great city of Jerusalem, this is one of the psalms to be sung. It's one of the psalms to be recited. It's also known, known among the Jews for some as a, a Shabbat dinner psalm, where at the end of a Sabbath dinner, this psalm will be recited it is so well known and loved because it marks a time when Israel dealt with crisis. And it shows us basic truths as the people of God and how to handle a crisis situation. Currently, I don't have to describe the crises in our world today. You're aware of the pandemic. You're aware of its effects on you, on your personal life, on businesses. If you're a small business owner, you're fully aware of the times in which we live. You're aware of the uh, racial strife, the riots in the streets, the concern about justice, the, the wondering about what's going to happen next among our justice systems. Crisis is a real thing. And as you face it, Psalm 126 will show you not just how to survive, but how to thrive in the face of crisis. Here's the psalm. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Verse 3, the Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. So here's a brief context. The crisis for them wasn't the coronavirus, rather 70 years of captivity in Babylon is the crisis that's being referred to here. So I want you just to imagine Maybe you right where you are just will put your hands together like, like I have here. And imagine that you're in bondage, that your people have been carted off, that your homeland has been destroyed, the temple of God is in ruins, your home is left desolate, your crops are left unattended to, and here you go off to a foreign land. The Babylonians were ruthless. They didn't even want to mess with the Israelites' young children. So some of you with young kids will find this to be so disturbing. They would take the younger children and toss them to the rocks so that the journey could be a little bit easier as they carted off these Israelite people to Babylon. And so for 70 years, the Jews have sat captive. And you can imagine that for at least a period of time, as their poets would cry out, oh, we wept by the rivers of Babylon, that at least for this period of time, they felt that they were no different to God than anyone else. Maybe we just all get the same lot. Maybe there is no distinction. Maybe God doesn't choose us. Maybe he doesn't love us a different way. But then, after 70 years of captivity, over the loudspeakers of the camp, as it were, this voice comes over the speakers and proclaims a miraculous message. To a select number of Jews... It's time for you to begin packing your bags. You may now go home. And the Jews are sitting there with other nations. Imagine being the Chaldeans. These other nations who have also been taken captive in Babylon. And it's them, miraculously, 70 years later, who are getting this message that they can pack up and begin to go home. And so for some, this is beginning to feel, as we come to the other side of this pandemic, it's beginning to feel a little bit like a coming out of the exile experience and you're beginning to interact a bit or go back to your work and back to your family and imagine what the Jews would have felt being the called out people who are getting now the chance to go home. And here's the truth of the first bit of this psalm, verses one through three. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. It was unreal. It was almost just too surreal to take in for them. But then notice, there's laughter, there's joy, and the nations will take notice and say, who is their God again? What do they call him? What's his name? He has done great things for them. The nations are testifying to the goodness of this Israelite God. They don't know this God, but they're taking notice and they're saying, wow, he has especially done great things for them since they get to go home. I was raised a Tennessee boy. All right, so I'm going to word this first point like this. This is the first truth you need to cling to during a time of crisis as the people of God. It goes like this. God loves all, but he prefers y'all. 
All right? God loves all the world, but he prefers y'all the church, which means just as the Jewish people have here, you have a special lot coming to you. There's some special thing he's going to do, some special announcement over the loudspeaker, some extravagant expression of his love that you, the chosen people of God, will receive. Peter says, a follower of Jesus Christ, he says, we who are now in Christ, we are the chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, just as it were here, that God would call out his people and give them a special blessing. So it is among you, his people. You might not see it yet. You might not can feel it yet. You might not be celebrating it yet. But you are his preferred. God loves all, but he prefers y'all. I remember uh, the first year of my marriage, sitting beside my wife in the pews of College Church of Christ in Searcy, Arkansas. That's where we attended church, and I had my arm around her, and we were singing songs. It's just a normal Sunday, pre COVID-19 when we would do these kind of things. And then I got up and I went back to use the bathroom and to get a drink. And I come back into the auditorium and I'm walking down the center aisle and I sit beside this beautiful blonde head girl, my wife Kristen, and I put, by, put my arm around her again and we just begin singing the next song. And then we sing the next one and I remember this is one that we really liked as a couple so I kind of elbow her like this in the, in the arm and I look over and it's not Kristen at all. No, it's, it's not my wife. So I'm as awkward as can be, and I just say to her, I say, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. If you just excuse me, I'm going to go now and sit with my wife. She's three rows ahead there uh, in the center. And so I got up, and I walked forward, and I sat in the center, and I, I put my arm around my real wife this time, and we sing this song. And she kind of leans over and whispers, and she says, where have you been? And I just had to be honest. I said I was with another woman uh, just three rows back, and I'm sorry, you know, I made a mistake. But I tell you this story. I hope you're laughing. Of course, I can't see you. I'm in an empty room. But I hope you're laughing because there is something comical about that mix-up and where I'm, I'm sitting with this wrong girl and I'm, I'm missing the opportunity just to be with my wife. But then imagine this. After the service, this poor girl, as awkward as can be, she comes up to me and she says, sorry, that was kind of strange. And I say, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't mind you. I like you just fine. But let me introduce you to my, my wife, Kristen. This is the one whom I love. And I tell all of the sisters of this congregation, I love them all so very much. But I only take one blonde-headed girl with four children home with me. And that's Kristen. And just as it is with God, he has a very special way of relating to you, his wife, where you get the most extravagant measures of his love, and he takes you home with him. He calls you out and loves you differently and specially. And before I move on to another point, I should just say this. This doesn't mean the church is exclusive. Neither is this that toxic rhetoric that we've all been afraid of our whole lives, that we're the only ones who get any blessing of God. And I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is the church is very inclusive and God opens the doors for all people. But for those who have put on Christ, you are the bride and he will love you specially with an extravagant measure of his love before all this is over. You got to remember that when you're in a crisis. The second thing you need to remember as we move into and out of this crisis is this. When the psalmist continues, there's a change in the tone in verse 3. It begins with this, the Lord has done great things for us and we're filled with joy. And there's a joyful start to this psalm. But then notice as verse 4 begins, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. There's this shift in tone because you get the image that the Israelites are now looking around and they're realizing, wait a second, only 50,000 of us came back. There's really not a lot of us that have come back. Many of us are still suffering in captivity. There's still major problems. Our economy's in the dumps. No one's been sowing seed. We don't have crops. We're in trouble. And so even when there is this time of rejoicing for God's people, there's also this time of realization that we still have a long way to go. A long way to go. And so they call out, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. I should explain what that means. The Negev, if you're familiar with the geography of 
of Israel. The Negev is the southern portion of Israel. It's a desert portion, a desert region. And in this desert region, there are these water courses, some that are full basins of water and others that you can see have been cut out by wind and water erosion of riverbeds and the like. But for most of the year, they sit cracked, dry, parched, nothing but dry, cracked land. But in the winter, a rain will come and these waterbeds don't just take on some water. They fill up to overflowing and they become these raging torrents of water that would destroy anything in its path. And then these flowers start to bloom on the waterbeds, just along the banks of these waterbeds. And it's a beautiful scene and it happens quickly, suddenly. And so what the psalmist is saying is, all right, we look around and we see we have so much more restoring to do. It's not just about coronavirus. We have to deal with these riots in the streets and we got to hear each other out. And there is so much that our land is needing right now in the way of restoration. There are some who are coming back, but there are many who are still not. There are still who are those who are suffering. There are still those who are missing in our number. There's a lot of restoring to do. And so what the psalmist is saying, God, we're going to do our part, and we're just going to brace for an invasion of grace. And sometimes the most faithful thing you can do is just sit like a dried water course, knowing that the rain will come, and that God is going to do something that will restore the land, that will bring vegetation, that will make flowers pop up, and it will take your breath away when he does. But the people of God should be known for sitting with our hands open to God saying, okay, when you're ready on your time and however you want to do it, we're ready for you. We're going to brace for an invasion of grace. I just wonder during this time, are you finding yourself in a posture of anticipation and expectation? Are you praying with your, with your hands ready to receive a blessing? The thing that the people of God have always known, and we see it here in this psalm, is that you can look all year at a dried waterbed and think nothing happens here. Or if you see with eyes of faith, you will know God is great enough, big enough, he's good enough to bring this to life. Brace for an invasion of grace. The second thing we do to survive and thrive in a crisis is brace for God's grace. Sit expectantly. Sit and pray with anticipation and be ready for an invasion of grace. Here's the next thing. You see them in the bottom of the psalm. They're sowing in tears, but they're reaping in songs of joy. They really go out weeping with their seeds to sow. And that can mean a lot of things. Commentaries uh, differ here on what the interpretation of this psalm really means. But I'm just going to show you one thing. One, One thing it might mean is that they have returned and they're looking at grain that they would actually enjoy eating. But now they walk out with this grain into these fields, these unkempt fields, and they begin to sow this grain. And there's all of this weeping of what has just happened? Why are we in this rebuilding phase? I would much rather just be eating a harvest right now of grain than sowing one to these unprepared fields. And what we know from the psalm is that They're working, they're making a wise decision. They're working for the months ahead. All right, they're working for the months ahead. But what you and I know is that Jesus told you, as you work for the months ahead, what did he teach us to do? Remember in the Lord's Prayer, he says, pray for daily bread. All right, work for the months ahead, but be praying for daily bread. And here's why I say that. In a time of crisis and in a time of rebuilding and in restructuring and trying to figure out life, it's all too easy to get months ahead in your thinking. What's going to happen in three months? What's our economy going to be like in three months? What's the curve of the virus going to be like in three months? What's the church going to be like in three, four, five months down the road? Will the riots stop in three, four, five months? Will we straighten things out? Will we finally come to a place of reconciliation? You can get way far down the road in your thinking. And Jesus teaches us, while you work for the months ahead, definitely do those things. Sow your seeds. But while you work for the months ahead, 
Be asking for daily bread. And here's why. If you're asking for daily bread, even in a time of crisis, you're going to notice God's provision. One meal here. One conversation with a friend here. One extra book at night with your kids here. And you're going to say, God, I see how you're providing for me right now. And as eager as we are for the harvest to come and for for full restoration to come in the months ahead, I notice what you're doing right now. I get get it. I see your blessing now. And I appreciate every meal. I appreciate every moment of peace. I appreciate every night's rest. And I'm thankful, God, for every new day. And I'm thankful for all the time that I've enjoyed with family and so on and so forth. So work for the months ahead, but be asking and noticing the moments of daily bread. If you're a Daniel Tiger fan like I am, I'm a young parent. I've got four kids, a six-year-old, a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a four-month-old. And Daniel Tiger has been really good for our family, okay? If you're older and you're not familiar with Daniel Tiger, he's that puppet that Mr. Rogers used. Maybe that will jar your memory a little bit. And Daniel Tiger has these jingles that just stick with you and they teach great life lessons. One of them, I'm not going to sing it, but one of them is this. Enjoy the wow that's happening now. All right, you say that one and let's do it together. Here it is. Enjoy the wow that's happening now. In a time of calamity and crisis and difficulty and stress and worry, as you ask for daily bread, you're going you're gonna to accomplish what Daniel Tiger is singing here in this jingle. Enjoy the wow that's happening now. Notice the blessings. Notice the moments where you should pause and say, God, I see you and I'm thankful for what you just did. I'm thankful, even for right now. And then I should also just mention there's something that's not explicit in this psalm. They're crying out, restore our fortunes, O Lord. And you get this scene at the very end that they're returning with songs of joy and they're carrying this harvest with them and that God has made things well. But I want to make a point here. How did God ultimately answer their prayer? Do you know? They're looking around and they're seeing a temple in ruins and they're saying, go restore our fortunes, O Lord. This is terrible. Did they ever get that back? No. For generations, the Jews mourned the fact that the glory days were behind them. The temple never looked like it did before this captivity. Things never returned to that place of, wow, here we are thriving and moving and on top and our glory days are ahead of us. It never really felt like that. And the older people would often say, guys, no, this is just a shell of what it once was. But do you know how he answered the prayer? He sent an angel to a virgin girl, a 15-year-old virgin girl on the hillside in Galilee. And he said, Mary, you are about to give birth to the Christ. Here's how God answered their prayer. He didn't take them back to the same. He gave them the Savior. That's the answer. And all the calamity and all the crisis and all the struggle and all the strife, out of it was born this moment, this sweet moment with this girl named Mary who was picked by God to bring in the Christ. And all of a sudden you see, he's not silent, he's not sleeping, God hasn't forgotten us, he has saved the best for us. And that's Jesus himself. So here's the point for us today. There are many who are saying, well, the glory days are behind us. No, the church buildings will never fill up again. And we'll all have to wonder about what could have been if it wasn't for coronavirus. And and I'm not ready to get there yet. Who knows what the new normal is going to look like if there is a new normal? Who who knows? If if someone tells you they know exactly what the days ahead are going to look like, don't trust them. No one knows. There's a lot to figure out. There are still many changes that are going to occur. There are decisions that have to be made and so on and so forth. But here's what we know. When you cry out, restore our fortunes, O Lord, as I believe we're crying out. And if you're not, let's cry that out. If you cry that out to God, we know for a fact that he's going to answer that with Jesus. 
So how can we, as the people of God, uniquely position ourselves to thrive in this time? And the answer is going to be this. Let's look for more Jesus in our lives. Let's be more about Christ than we have ever been before. However often you talked about him, however often you talked to him, however often you sang about him, however often you were serving him, evangelizing, going to serve the community in his name, praying for others in his name, following him, choosing holiness in his name, whatever you were doing pre-COVID-19, let's devote ourselves a hundred times as much post-COVID-19. Let's let the new normal be that we are 100% about Jesus Christ, 100%. And that there was that time before the virus, and now there is this time with Jesus after. Our love for him has increased. We're looking for him in our lives. We follow him with more devotion now. God answers with Jesus as the exiles return home. What if he's answering with him now? What if he's saying to us now, don't you really just need Jesus Can you trust anything else? Can you put your hope in anything else? Can you predict anything else? Does anything else win? Does anything else overcome death? Does anything else give you hope? Let's be about Jesus. At all churches, Bellevue Church of Christ, be about Jesus. Here at North Boulevard, I've encouraged this campus and David, his, you know, East Campus, let's be about Jesus Christ. Let us, let us be the people who come out of this so in love with Jesus that it's evident. We have refocused. We have reprioritized. And he's on top. Elizabeth Elliot could have gone a, a host of multiple directions. She could have turned to the left. She could have turned to the right. She could have gone to bitterness and anger. Elizabeth Elliot had the whole world in front of her and the choices of what her new normal was going to be after this tragic news of Jim Elliot's passing. But do you know what she did? Two years later, Elizabeth Elliot makes the decision, crazy as it might seem, to go to the very people who took her husband's life and to live among them. It was as if She was reminded, I'm not here for Jim. I'm here for Jesus. And after this crisis, I will be more about Jesus than I ever was before. So she goes to this Aka tribe. She lives among them. She forgives these tribesmen who have taken the life of her husband and friends. And these other women come with her, relatives of these men who have lost their lives, and they forgive them. And Elizabeth then sits and teaches the gospel. And the very men who took her husband's life are baptized into Christ. And the tribe now, if you were to look them up in Ecuador, you'll see that there is not just a Christian outpost, but there, there are thriving Christians because of the work of Elizabeth Elliot. What if she had decided She wasn't going to be about Jesus after her crisis at all. The world would be a different place. But instead, she recommitted in the crisis to being fully about Jesus Christ. And you can do the same today. This is our time to evaluate what matters most. What direction will we choose? Over the things that we can control, what will the new normal look like? Will it not be that will be more devoted followers of Christ. I've really enjoyed my time with you today. I pray blessings over you, Bellevue, and I'd like to pray one now as we close. Would you pray with me? Father, you are a good God. You haven't forgotten us. You love us. You will give us a special blessing, and you have already, some of which we've noticed, some we haven't even yet to notice. Lord, we know that you provide, God, that you have plans, and that ultimately you have, beyond anything we deserve, you have rewarded us with Jesus Christ, your own Son, who has shown us your love fully. Let us be about him right now, Father. Let us talk about him. Let us devote ourselves to him. Let us honor him. Let us worship him. 
make it so clear, God, that we are his people. Coming out of this, it is undeniable. And we pray this over Bellevue Church of Christ, over North Boulevard, over all of your people everywhere. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks again for being with me this morning. Restore my spirit, Lord. As we come to this the close of this period of worship, I thought it might be useful to take a moment to consider the uncertain times that we're living through right now. Most of us are living through an extended period of quarantine, and unless we have experienced health issues that required us to do so, this is a new experience for most of us. As the days run together, we find ourselves struggling with the lack of fellowship that we have come to take for granted. To help us cope with this new reality, I thought it might be useful to look to Jesus and glean from the scriptures the way he handled periods of solitude. Jesus frequently withdrew from people. Daily life activities and the demands of his ministry to be alone with the Father and pray. In fact, Jesus' solitude and silence is a major theme in the gospel. It's how he began his ministry. At once the Spirit sent Jesus out into the desert, and he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. It's how he made important decisions. Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him. It's how he dealt with troubling emotions of grief. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. It's how he dealt with constant demands of his ministry and cared for his soul. After Jesus had dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was still there alone. It's also how he prepared himself for the death on the cross. When Jesus and his disciples had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This was Jesus' usual place to pray when he was in Jerusalem. If we consider how Jesus valued his time alone and how he used it to draw closer to his Father, perhaps we can turn this temporary period of inconvenience into a blessing. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we acknowledge that you are the creator of all we see and experience and that you alone are in control of the world we live in. 
We thank you for all the blessings that you have provided us, especially the life of your Son and the example he set for us to guide us through this life. As we close this period of worship and prepare to enter into a new week, we would like to pause to ask you for help and protection. We live in a world filled with hate and injustice. Help us rely on you for guidance. We also ask that you help comfort the families of those lost to this pandemic, and that if it be your will that you remove this affliction from us. We also pray for peace and a resolution to the violence and injustice that is so much a part of our lives. We ask that, you may, that we may soon be able to meet together again and worship you. We also ask that you protect us in the week ahead and forgive us our shortcomings. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 
take the Lord. 